important right now uh, during COVID-19 um, pandemic and beyond. Uh, this will be a part of an ongoing series by the Behavioral Health Integration Collab Collaborative, which is a group of leading medical organizations dedicated to catalyzing the effective and sustainable integration of behavioral and mental health care into physical health practices. Uh, the collaborative is committed to ensuring a professionally satisfying sustainable physician practice experience and will act as a trusted partner to assist in overcoming the obstacles that stand in the way of meeting patients' mental and behavioral health care needs. Uh, today, we're going to start off this series with really focusing on the value of collaboration in a shared culture in behavioral health integration. And I'm excited to present with three other uh, leaders really in the area of um, thinking about this, uh, who will each provide a different perspective around behavioral health integration uh, and hopefully provide attendees with actionable insights on how best to collaborate with each other to integrate behavioral health within current workflows. Um, we also will spend some time discussing how such efforts can help clinical teams experience less professional burnout, uh, knowing they have enough knowledge and support to meet the needs of their patients. And uh, finally, at the end of this, uh, we will be uh, talking for a little bit in this presentation, but want to leave plenty of room for Q&A um, so that you can ask your questions to the people who um, are on this panel, as well as myself. Um, so what we are going to ask is that during this interview, we have everybody put themselves on mute um, and turn off their cameras. And then uh, please utilize the chat function um, it, for any questions you may have. We'll be getting to those at the end of the presentation. Um, and we are recording this uh, webinar. You should have seen that little box pop up. Um, and both the recording and the slides will be shared in an email following the event. Uh, a survey is also included, and we appreciate if you provide feedback to us uh, as we continue to plan this series uh, and really be able to provide actionable help um, to your behavioral health integration efforts. So I'm going to go ahead um, and kick off the session with a few framing comments uh, around um, really that collaboration, um, what is known a little bit around the evidence, um, I'll focus a little bit on the evidence base of behavioral health integration, um, but really want to spend most of our time today really talking about the need for a shared culture and hearing uh, perspectives from the field on how people made that transition um, into a shared culture. So we'll go ahead and go to the next um, slide. Okay, so uh, I like to start out um, when I'm speaking about behavioral health integration with this world health um, definition of health. Uh, and the fact that it, you know, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. infirmity. And though all, we've known this for a long time, I mean, this quote is from 1948, I think really. Only in the last 15, 20 years have we really seen people starting to think about models of how to move in the direction of accomplishing this first in research. And now really, um, I think, moving that out into the real world in a very meaningful way across many practices across the United States. Um, why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. And I think we really are focusing on uh, the integration of mental health and behavioral health into medical settings because of what we know about where people access mental health treatment. So this slide represents 10 people in the United States. Um, this is data from a national comorbidity study. And what they found in this study is that if people had had symptoms of a common mental health disorder in the last year, um, they asked those, those folks, where did you receive care? 60% uh, of them had not received any care. And those of the people who said that they had received at least a single visit um, of service, about half of them, or 20% of the total sample, had seen a primary care provider, and about half of them had seen a specialty mental health provider, with that split about evenly between psychiatrists um, and psychologists and other um, mental health counselors. So I think what these data show us is that um, access uh, to uh, mental health treatment is really limited and that most patients are not likely to start uh, by accessing specialty mental health. So thinking about how can we integrate 
access to care within our physical health settings is going to be a really important part of increasing um, access overall and addressing these common concerns, which of course impact someone's overall health. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, and why are we talking about this, especially right now? Um, so uh, we are focusing on this now because um, of the concern for increased behavioral health burden uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I went to try to find some actual data because I have a lot of anecdotal practice um, experience related to this, but wanted to give you all some actual numbers um, and went to the um, CDC website, which you can see referenced on the bottom here. And uh, these were this was basically a national national um, community sample um, trying to understand what the current burden of mental health disorders are. And I think there's a really interesting data. I mean, there's lots of limitations and I encourage you to go um, and read them. But I think overall this represents my experience and probably many of your experience of our current patient populations now. Um, what they saw with these data is that, is that the community was reporting three times as many symptoms of anxiety disorders, four times the prevalence of depressive disorders, um, about 25% of the people reporting traumatic stress um, and about 10% um, reporting increased substance use because of COVID-19. And I think that that really represents that a large percentage of our populations are really struggling right now. Um, I also think, you know, the other important piece of data that came out of this study was looking at the risk for suicide and that there is a large, uh, probably about doubling the risk of people having a serious consideration of suicide um, compared to data from 2018. And I think what this really says is that, you know, probably what many of us are experiencing, that our population is stressed um, and, and that that has increased the burden of mental health and behavioral health concerns. And so all of us really, I think, are trying to think about how can we improve access to the services that the whole population really needs right now. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide. Um, so I think we need to start thinking about what some of the answers might be. So um, I work at the University of Washington. I co-direct the AIM Center, which is an, a center dedicated to implementing collaborative care. Uh, and, and here, you know, what we have really focused on is thinking about how do we increase um, and broaden that spectrum of access to care uh, for meeting those community behavioral and physical health needs um, in an integrated way. And this pyramid is really to show you that, you know, what exactly those early data showed you that probably the large majority of the uh, services for common mental health disorders are actually delivered in primary care. Um, a lot of these are, are managed by primary care providers on their own um, through patient self-management or for, through other community supports. Um, what we'll talk about today is how can we build this next layer um, where we're actually trying to offer evidence-based approaches to expand access in those medical settings um, to effective treatment. And so we'll talk a little bit um, about some of the evidence base and then we'll hear some practical practice experience around that. Um, and this is, of course, not going to meet all the needs, but we're hoping that by creating a, a bigger spectrum of care um, that pulls a little of the burden off of our specialty mental health settings, really providing more access overall for all of our patients. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, so I want to just touch briefly on um, one of the largest trials today of collaborative care, which is an evidence-based strategy of integrating mental health care into primary care settings. And what I want to focus on is less the details of this actual model, but more in some of the principles that we think really drive the better outcomes of care that we're seeing in this model as uh, principles to strive for as you begin your journey towards behavioral health integration. Uh, so the first um, idea that's really important is really thinking of uh, providing mental health care and primary care and other medical settings as a team sport. So that you really have to start with um, developing and defining roles and responsibilities for a prepared proactive practice teams. Uh, in the collaborative care model, that's often integrating a behavioral health support person, a care manager right into um, behavioral health practices. Um, the good news is a lot of this has been done virtually in many of these trials. So um, that's actually something that's very practical right now uh, to think about when many 
many of us are still using a combination of virtual and in-person visits. Um, this model also leverages psychiatric expertise in a really specific way. Um, so it brings in psychiatrist or psychiatric provider support to actually help that team with treatment, decision-making, and diagnosis um, through um, a case review process. So that's really starting with the team. Um, we really consider the patient at the center of that team. So I think that's very aligned with most of us who are thinking from a very patient care um, centered care model, um, shared decision making as the foundation of how all of that care would be delivered. Um, then there are several um, practical strategies that are worth thinking about as you think about how you might build a behavioral health integration approach in your practice. The first of these is really using regular use of measurement based um, treatment to target. So regularly assessing is whatever treatment you're able to offer actually getting the patient better uh, and changing the treatment if that doesn't work. Um, using population registries. So this is a list of all the patients that you've identified that need help and really making sure none of those fall through the cracks. Um, being able to offer that full range of evidence-based treatment in your practice from both medication management uh, strategies to um, evidence-based psychotherapies. Um, and then thinking about how do you leverage your available resources including psychiatric resources to support that work of the team. Um, so this model, when it's delivered um, in the structure called collaborative care, um, has actually been shown to be very effective. If you look at the next slide, um, these are the data from that large randomized controlled trial. In this particular trial, patients were randomized at the patient level to either collaborative care, as I just described it, um, or um, usual care and primary care. And what you can see is that by organizing care using those resources that I described, um, you could actually get twice as many people better from depression. Uh, and I think that's a really important strategy when we start to think about if we could take care of those people effectively in primary care or other medical settings, um, again, that might increase access overall to, to mental health care. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, there are a few other data from these, this trial, the IMPACT trial. Um, the first thing is that this is um, also important and that we did, when you looked at disparity populations, saw similar benefit, if not a, a, an even larger benefit, probably due to the fact that some of our disparity populations have even more um, limited access to mental health um, treatment. So that's a really important outcome. So delivering behavioral health integration strategies may address some health equity issues as well. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and that it wasn't just that patients got better. This was actually um, important for improving um, physical pain, um, functioning of patients. Uh, they reported higher quality of life. Um, patients reported this as a satisfactory way to receive care and providers were really happy um, with this as well. So this really um, addresses that triple or quadruple aim. Um, I think it's also important to note that in this particular study, they were able to show reduced healthcare costs overall when they looked at those costs over the next four years. Patients that had been treated with the collaborative care model um, had a reduction of about $4,000 in healthcare spending. Most of that attributed to um, a reduction in physical health hospitalizations. Um, so I think this again emphasizes that when we address mental health conditions, we're actually addressing that whole person um, and really um, improving their overall health. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So I wanted to give you a very brief overview um, of uh, why we're here today, um, a little bit around some of the evidence base and some of the practical pieces that you might wanna be thinking about building in your practices as you work on um, behavioral health integration, and then really spend the rest of this time actually hearing from our three panelists about their journey um, in, in building kind of a culture of collaboration and behavioral health integration into their settings. Uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about how did they sort of um, build a shared culture uh, that, that requires sort of bridging between the mental health culture or behavioral health culture and a physical health culture um, in terms of how providers approach um, addressing care. Um, that often requires a lot of buy-in um, from all levels, patients, providers, systems. Um, it also is really important that people identify what are their goals, um, what are those first goals, uh, and making sure you have a good way to measure those um, and assess 
assess your progress as you start on your behavioral health integration journey. Um, and that a lot of that really requires very robust practice change to happen. Um, so really all of these things work together to make for a successful behavioral health integration effort. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and let each of our panelists um, introduce themselves um, and give a couple of uh, like a minute explanation of sort of their journey um, and, and their current setting um, uh, for their behavioral health um, integration efforts. And then we're gonna kind of have each of them answer some questions um, as well as um, any questions you may have. So continue to feel free to add questions into uh, the chat box uh, as we're hearing from our panelists. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, and I'm gonna start with Dr. Karen Smith. Um, do you wanna introduce yourself and, and where you're currently practicing? Yes, I'm Karen Smith. I'm a family physician and I practice in Rayford, North Carolina. It's about 20 miles south of the Fort Bragg Fayetteville area. So a little bit about our community. Um, we have a very diverse population, mainly that of the uh, Caucasian, we have American Native Indian of the Lumbee population and also African American, Latinx. So, and because we are uh, kind of distance from the uh, Fort Bragg installation, we do see people of other backgrounds. So what is our history? We were fortunate to be part of a GIFRA study um, utilizing the Esberg model, which was exactly that, collaboration. So we started off in our practice with learning how to identify individuals who did have mental health problems, mainly that of anxiety and depression, utilizing those uh, depression scales. But then we were fortunate to actually have a mental health person who was embedded in the practice. And so if someone was identified, we could then take our um, patient, walk them to the individual who would then start the mental health um, part of it. And mainly we were looking at uh, alcohol use, um, those disorders. We later um, expanded in terms of the uh, treatment of medication assisted treatment and recognized that, um, recognized that we had a, a problem in our community with that of opiate use disorder. And we were actually seeing our neighbors and friends who were dying of overdose. And from there, with medication-assisted treatment, we found um, the need to expand our mental health services that were already in the office and incorporated individuals who had a uh, licensed clinical addiction uh, specialty as well as the LCSW. And so that is how we became involved. I wanna say the key um, for us as a family physician, recognizing the, the need of the patient-centered medical home, one-stop shop, and knowing that we were taking care of their medical problems as well as their behavior health problems. The motto in our practice started off with, we are the power of touch, physical, spiritual, and emotional. So we wanted to make sure that we were taking care of the whole person. Thank you so much. It's really exciting and inspiring to hear about your journey. And we'll come back a little bit later to hear a little bit more about um, especially patient and family experience um, since you've made those um, important transformational efforts in your, your practice. Um, let's go ahead and go to Dr. Rhodes um, and hear a little bit about what brought you into behavioral health integration. Sure. Um, I'm Corinne Rhodes and I'm an internist at Penn Medicine. And so I practice in, my practice site is in West Philadelphia. And I'm taking a slightly different perspective here uh, than Dr. Smith is talking about. We implemented our program as part of a Medicare demonstration grant, uh, Comprehensive Primary Care Plus. And so we had to look at a large systems level um, to implement behavioral health uh, as a mandate by the end of a year. And so we had a very tight timeline to do this. And the way that we did it was actually twofold. Uh, for eight of our practices initially, we embedded a licensed clinical social worker with a similar model to what you just uh, demonstrated. And in addition to that, actually had a, um, we have a triage service uh, that is staffed by uh, mental health intake coordinators that's able to kind of funnel our patients either to the LCSWs within the practices or based on their insurances or their needs find them another place to go outside of our practices if they need that. The other uh, components of our practices actually 
um, worked with a private company and then were able to embed behavioral health uh, within those practices by partnering with that private partner. And it's really been interesting. I happen to be in one of the practices that has an LCSW that's within our system and supported by our system as well as supported by psychiatry. And it's been transformationally wonderful to see our practice before and after this. Um, and then I think also very interesting from a systems level uh, to look at two side-by-side -side, uh, programs and, and to see the, the strengths and the struggles of each of them. Thank you. It's really helpful to hear that sometimes you need multiple approaches to actually start to address the needs of your populations, given the resources that are available. And I think we can touch on that um, a little bit more as well. And I'm going to um, turn to Dr. Schlesinger. Can you share a little bit about your journey? Yeah, my name is Abby Schlesinger. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, but I'm here because I'm the chief of um, integrated care for uh, Western Psychiatric Hospital and Children's Hospital. And uh, my journey started over 20 years ago in a rural clinic in Pennsylvania um, with a simple integration with a local mental health clinic. Um, but at this point, we, I have more of a systems perspective where we um, implemented a large network of um, embedded primary care in primary care of LCSWs. We then moved to psychologists embedded in uh, specialty services in our hospitals, um, and then moved to the adult primary care world with LCSWs embedded there. Um, I resonate very much with this idea that you need to sort of strike this from multiple angles. Uh, we've been able to get some additional funding to do a, what's called an MCPAP-like model, which is a model where a psychiatrist is available to answer questions from a primary care doctor. And we've been able to implement that successfully on the child side um, and also to some extent on the adult side. Um, and now we're also expanding into um, doing more of a coordinated model where we're uh, identifying kids at risk for substance use and having a psychiatrist, primary care doctor, and family work together to try to get them moving in the right direction. So it's great to hear both from the perspective of sort of a broader range of the age span. So I think that's often a question that comes up is sort of how do we think about that full age range from pediatrics all the way to geriatrics. So fun to hear about one end of that spectrum. And then um, I think also just I, we will get into talking a little bit more about that systems perspective because I think um, how the system is ready to, you know, and prepared to actually um, take on this new scope of practice in some ways um, can be a really important part of building success in your program. So excited to come back and talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, so I'm going to turn now back to Dr. Smith and ask her if she would share a little bit about, you know, sort of what her experience has been uh, around the patient and family experience, you know, really kind of bring that perspective in and, 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 and especially when we're thinking about buy-in and, you know, our motivation for doing all the hard work of practice change, you know, hearing that perspective of, of the ultimate why I think is really helpful. Yeah. A patient experience um, for our community, we really have made a difference, recognizing that we only have five practices in the entire town. Um, later, uh, we had a hospital center, um, a hospital system that um, set up a satellite, and both of them, two of them did. Um, but even then, the services were limited. One of the things that really was uh, striking to me was the lack of services for our African American and Latinx and um, Native American Indian population. And I really felt like these individuals were suffering um, and we wanted to try to make a difference. I actually remember when we first had our um, introduced the um, African-American male who was suffering from heroin of many years and how we were able to uh, bring him in, um, start with the MAT program and embraced him in terms of getting total medical care uh, in the office. Unfortunately, he has since developed a terminal uh, carcinoma, but he had access to health care. And so not only are we treating his substance use disorder, but we're also treating his cancer. And he recognizes this as his medical home. Um, I, I remember the story of a mother who just while we were evaluating her hypertension and she was so upset and distressed and we found out it was because her son had sold her kitchen set to pay a drug deal. And that was having impact on her hypertension. And we could, again, embrace that family um, as part of the services that we were offering in the office. 
And so the, the impact of having behavior health integrated in the primary care setting, many of us can come up with multiple stories. The, how do we get past the stigmatism in a very small community in a, in a town where everyone knows each other? Well, I trained in Philadelphia and I could tell you there was the same stigmatism in Philadelphia. An individual who's suffering from depression and anxiety in Philadelphia also has anxiety and depression in a small town community. But the differences in terms of the resources and where people go to seek help and how many of the neighbors know about this. Um, we found that there were issues with not having enough physicians, let alone primary care physicians. But what about our psychiatric colleague? What about our addiction medicine um, colleagues? That does not exist in this community and the nearest one is a good 30 miles away. And so that meant we needed to be able to absorb and take care of those issues within the um, medical home. Crisis intervention in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, how do we intervene? And so all of these uh, we had to take care of. And as an independent physician, we reach out to our colleagues who are part of our societies like the North Carolina Medical Society or the uh, North Carolina Academy of Family Physicians and utilize those resources. The Medical Society actually brought forth a program called Project OBOT uh, with the recovery platform. And we partnered up with a Hope, and, a Hope and Hope Collaborative, which brought many entities around the table in a very collaborative effort, along with mental health, the school system, the judicial system. And so, Again, it's beyond that of just that individual family, but how do we tuck that individual and that family in those resources and embed them, yet those services are coming through the medical home, which we are the family physician who is taking care of those individuals. Yeah, that's really, uh, it's very inspirational. And I think one of the things I really hear in what you're saying is that, you know, one of the ways that you also address some of the common challenges in engaging patients is really engaging the whole community um, in, in the way that you addressed um, sort of building a program. And I think that that's um, a helpful reminder to those people that might be earlier in their journey that there might be resources that you haven't thought of in a more traditional sense. So I don't know if you want to add anything about that. Absolutely. And we really did have to think out of the box. I was so pleased to present the Hope and Hope Collaborative alongside with our Surgeon General, um, Dr. Jerome Adams. And we were really proud of the group. The group continues to meet. Um, we were able to um, bring aboard our, um, uh, our, our governor's office. Um, they sent representative I was actually on a plane sitting next to the commander for Fort Bragg and I was just walking along and I mentioned the work that we were doing in our community. And he said, you know, Womack Army Medical Center needs to be part of that. I had no idea who I was talking to. Well, that the very next meeting, we've had representatives from the military. And one of the things that I said to him, we need data and we need to know how many people are really suffering from these problems. And he said, one thing about the Pentagon, we have lots of data. So he brought the data platform to the table. And we looked at what, it, what was our sheriff's department? How were they handling this issue? They were going into the homes. They were the crisis intervention. And they came to the table. And now when we look up and we look around our table, we had the school system. We had education was part of it. Children were leaving their home in the morning distress, going to school, and the teachers really didn't know how to handle it. So our collaborative grew, and before we knew it, we had a host of people who were interested in how do we take care of the mental health issues, the opiate use disorders, the substance use disorders. So it was a community collaborative that we so just delighted to have all of those individuals. Thank you so much. I think that's really um, a, a good reminder to all of us that, you know, when we feel kind of overwhelmed sometimes, I think trying to address some of the challenges that we face, that there's often um, community support. So I think that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to turn now to Dr. Rhodes and, and talk a little bit about the provider experience, because I think that, you know, we heard a bit about the 
patient, family, and community experience and how valuable that is. But, um, I, you know, my own experience in partnering with um, primary care settings as a, as a mental health professional is that that provider experience is very important to try to build these new programs. So I guess I'd love to hear a little bit about how, how that's worked in your practices. Absolutely. I feel like we're going from kind of like the macro community to the small community of the practice. Um, where I, I'm going to speak from my personal experience. Um, when I started uh, my practice, I think it was incredibly frustrating as a provider to see the same patients again and again, to print out lists, to tell them to call places, to try to connect them with resources and find that patients were not connecting um, to the services that we know that they needed, to see them without the motivation to follow through on a plan and not be able to kind of move their care forward or not be able to help navigate the system for them. And so for me, it's been an incredible transformation to have that partnership within the practice to make sure that patients are connected. And I think um, I'll kind of speak twofold, you know, on the one hand, um, I, you know, I work within uh, the electronic health uh, record that my behavioral specialist does. And so I get those notes as they meet with them each week and we're able to kind of start a conversation. I'm, I'm better to better understand some of the challenges that my patients have and I'm able to build a relationship with the, the LCSW in my practice. I will say that the first one I worked with, you know, was incredibly wonderful and we actually had someone start right before COVID and I've literally never met her face to face because she's been off site this entire time, but I feel like I know her so well um, from the different messages that we send and when we kind of get on the phone to talk about challenges as well as the um, psychiatry support that she has and that I have. I can reach out to the psychiatrist when I have patients who are well out of my comfort zone, who I need to bridge until they get to a psychiatrist. I recognize, you know, that this is well out of my comfort zone. I should never be managing, you know, um, you know, some of these disorders, but I'm able to, you know, create a, a kind of more steady approach until I plug them into the care they need while also able to kind of expand my comfort zone within depression, within anxiety, um, we talk about, you know, we also address some substance abuse uh, disorders within our clinics. And I think that having that support um, has really allowed us to engage and expand. Uh, they've, we've also had like more educational meetings with our psychiatry colleagues. You know, I now know the names of more of the people who work, you know, within all of these different um, community uh, building exercises that I think are incredibly important um, to feel more plugged into the community as a PCP. And then I will just kind of like circle back around to that patient who can't, I'm sorry, you might hear my kids screaming in the background, apologies. But um, for that patient who, you know, used to be referred and referred and not connect, um, the call center that I was talking about that we work with, um, the persistence of them to be able to kind of follow through on the patient, close the loop with me. I didn't get a hold of this patient. We tried this numbers of times, refer them again if you need them. I can have the patient sit in the room, call, you know, right there, let them stay there, start the intake, have them stay there if we can do it or at least schedule it at a different time so that we can get over some of these initial hurdles together. And then, um, you know, once that assessment is done, that also comes back to me. And so if they can't be seen with an R program, our program because of insurance, et cetera. I know where they're headed. I know the three, you know, maybe there's three places they were referred. These are all vetted places that are actually accepting patients and we know how quickly they're going to get in there. Um, like that is gold um, for me to be able to plug my patients in. And if they came back and didn't follow through on it, I can quickly print out that list and give it to them or speak to them over the phone or kind of bump them back to our team to make sure that they have this warm handoff as they need it. I could go on, but I will just stop. Yeah, I, I, what I hear though really is as a provider having that um, partnership of someone who has the sort of time and resources, quite frankly, to do some of that follow-up that of course you'd like to be able to do, but you have to sometimes move on to that next patient can be really valuable to feel like you're able to, to really provide that whole person care that I think all of us, you know, have gone into medicine to be able to do, right? To really be able to help our patients and address the needs that they're coming in with. So it's, it's 
fabulous to hear that story. Um, and I, I think what we also heard is, you know, a lot of communication in your story, right? And so I, I think that's one of the things that, you know, when we talk about building that culture of collaboration, I think a lot of it is, is, is communication, but also being really flexible. I heard all different modes of communication. I heard, you know, e-messaging and, you know, phone calls and quick conversations and that there's a lot of flexibility in the way you might do that. So I, I think that's a real inspiration to people who might be listening who think, gosh, you you know, we'd only have somebody off site. Well, you can still be pretty successful, even if you've never met the person um, in person with, with if you're creative and maybe how you approach um, creating that culture of collaboration. So thank you for that example. Um, I want to go ahead and um, turn to Dr. Schlesinger to hear a little bit about systems perspectives. Um, you know, obviously, you know, buy-in of leadership to, to be able to make that practice change to support the time it takes. Um, and also really getting clear about both system level goals and how do you balance those some with the, the provider and patient level goals, I think is a really important consideration as people are thinking about building new capacity. So please share a little of your experience. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, you know, I think that uh, although I'm currently working in a pretty large system and many people on this uh, panel are in large systems or were supported by grants to get started, I think that we're hoping as part of this that we'll have people here that aren't in a large system, aren't in a large grant, but want to try to figure out how to make it work. And I think there's some principles that work no matter about how big the system is uh, that I've uh, consulted with a lot of young psychiatrists and primary care doctors thinking about doing this that can help. And, I, and the word culture really does help when you think about that. You have to think about sort of, I like to think of it in three roles. What's the clinical and practice culture of the place you're going? What's the administrative culture of the place? And then what's the leadership culture? And in a small one person, what, like five person class practice or two person practice, it might be pretty simple. Um, in a larger, the questions get more complicated. Um, but to sort of be more specific, when you think about the clinical culture, it's what the physicians and the people in the practice, not just the physicians, because it really is a team sport, right? Everybody has to be on board. So what's their experience been with mental health and what do they want from this initiative? Likewise, for the behavioral health people, what's their experience with primary care and what do they want from this initiative? Knowing that when you first start, you're probably not going to have had the same experiences and want the same things. So uh, someone here said, what's your one piece of advice? And one of my pieces of advice, I think, would be recognize you're not going to start at the same place and you've got to choose low hanging fruit to start with. So um, you can't come in and just dictate the primary care can't dictate to the behavioral health, the behavioral health can't dictate to the primary care. Everybody's got to be flexible. Um, and I think flexible comes up a lot. But then there's also the administrative culture that can cause a clash that you need to be thoughtful about. Uh, many behavioral health providers are used to um, you get a call for an intake and you may not respond right away. Um, maybe not because they mean to not respond, but because they're overwhelmed and that's not where they're, they're focused. Whereas in a primary care offices, most primary care offices, they're quick to respond to issues and especially behavioral health issues when they get nervous um, and they want things responded to quickly. Um, administrative, the administrative practice may not understand how to bill for behavioral health. So uh, it's important to think about, do they have the capacity to do that or do you need to bring in other people to help them with that? The other administrative thing is there's often different cultures about scheduling. Like some therapists will only schedule every hour on the hour with a 10 minute break between and they don't want to have flexibility. That's not what they want. Those people don't belong in primary care, probably. <laughs> I see uh, Dr. Ratchcliffe laughing, but I, I, I've been there. Um, the best of the therapists need to be in the right, uh, the right situation. And then finally, there's the leadership culture. And you know, just like in medicine, there's who says they're in charge, and then there's who's actually going to help you implement on the ground. So you may have to make a lot of friends, um, both the ones that are sort of maybe writing checks to get things done, but also the people that are really going to be the ones that make it work for you uh, when you're doing the implementation. So, you know, I think those, if you think about those cultural things related to the practice, the administration, the leadership, that, that would work whether you're in a small practice or whether you're in a multi-system practice across the board. Uh, we can't hear you. Mike. 
screen decided to block my unmute button. Um, so uh, I just, I really thank you for giving some like really practical um, strategies. And I think having that conceptualization of those different um, groups that really need to have buy-in um, to get started is really helpful. And I, and I agree, it's, it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, two people trying to figure this out or, you know, a whole large um, scale system, you really do need to have those, those, you know, that balance of like motivation, practical considerations, and then, and then a shared understanding. And I, I mean, I think identifying goals should probably be identifying shared goals, because I think, you know, at the end of the day, you probably need to find something that everyone can at least agree is an important place to start um, and, and have a, a shared understanding of what success would look like so that you can all be working towards that goal together. And I, I think that's a really helpful thing. Um, even if you're starting small, I mean, it might be like really building a great referral system, right? And that that might be the first thing you, you need to do. Um, that was part of what Dr. Rhodes talked about, whereas, you know, you might also want to try to bring someone in. And those are two different strategies to hopefully accomplish that same goal of um, increasing access, right? Um, making, helping our patients get to where they need to go. I just think that's so important because if you agree on what your first goal is, then you can build on success. If you don't agree on that first goal and you like place it too high or you're not really a team sort of figuring it out, then it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to feel like you were successful. So yeah, and it's really important to talk about it. I remember one of my early implementation efforts, we were integrating uh, physical health and behavioral health actually in a community mental health center. And um, the you know mental health folks were really excited to have physical health there because they wanted lithium levels. And the um, physical health people there were like thinking about cancer screening. And those were you know potentially aligned goals, but not yet aligned until there'd been some conversations and making sure that everybody has that conversation as you're starting um, can be really helpful to getting off on um, um, a good expectation, shared expectation, shared um, journey. So thank you for some guiding um, ideas. I think we should move on to some of the um, questions because, and I, I think you already answered the first one, Dr. Schlesinger, which is sort of what's a piece of advice. So uh, I think I'd like to go ahead and um, see if Dr. Rhodes or Dr. Smith wants to chime in with, with their words of wisdom um, for that practice kind of just um, getting started. Like what do you wish you'd known before you'd stepped into that journey? You want to start, Dr. Rhodes? Sure. Um, just get my video up. Yeah. I think it's. I think what resonated with me so much is what are the goals and and how will we get there? I think for us, we struggled a lot with the like finances and there was like billing. I feel like there was a lot of things that were just you know, it can weigh you down um, with all of those details that are incredibly important to make sure that this pilot is successful when you step it up. Um, and so marrying those, those people with that operation focus with those, with the people who have the larger focus of like helping the patients and having those stories of the patients. I think um, that's how we started this hour, right? With um, Dr. Smith talking about those patient stories. And so when you're thinking about the people who are writing the checks or who are looking at, you know, you haven't quite seen the returns yet, I think it's important to have those patient stories front and center. Um, I think also physician happiness is also, you know, a good thing to, to look at as well. But I think that those patient stories are incredibly powerful to your stakeholders. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to think about because I think we can't undervalue enough the power of story, especially in the early days of your program um, when you need those early wins. Um, I think sharing those stories at provider meetings um, and and promoting them so that everyone gets a chance to kind of feel a sense of accomplishment and ownership of, of some success early can be really valuable to, to energize the team to then, you know, complete that work. There's always the next thing in your continuous QI that you have to do. Um, um, and sometimes before you have hard data, um, those stories are really sustaining. So I, I love that example, at least. Uh, that's definitely been my experience as well. So um, Dr. Smith, do you want to add your words of wisdom? The, the best thing that I can come up with is, is to identify that champion, um, the person who really wants to do this. I can tell you, I, I have lots of stories. So when we introduced our very first patient who had opiate use disorder, it was a disaster. I actually had to call the sheriff's department. And so despite having our LCAS on board, um, so the staff was not engaged anymore. And we had to let them know not all goes well with the first time you attempt something 
despite having a great workflow. And so we had to encourage our team. We had to be able to go back and revamp and, and redo it and, and make sure that everyone was part of it. But it took the physician champion. It took that one voice to encourage the rest of the team, stay engaged, stay with the plan. Let's do our plan, do, study, act. Let's <laughs> modify and revisit and redo it. But the goal was to provide people with a desperately needed service. So that would be my encouraging point. The other thing I would say, um, because we are uh, heavily engaged with electronic health records and utilizing telehealth, that has been the saving platform, particularly during COVID. Um, keeping the communication, not only between us within our team, within the, um, the mental health people who are providing services via telehealth, but the patients. And I can't say enough about that technology. Great. So we have a couple of, that's, those are really helpful. I really like starting out with like good pieces of advice because, and I, I think I, I would share all of those. I mean, I think those are all really, really helpful. Um, we have a couple of other questions. So I'm going to put them out to the, the group here. Um, I think that there is um, a question around sort of a specific population. So I'll start with the first question, which is how do you start collaborating for kids? So, I mean, there was both, how do you start collaborating with pediatricians in an outpatient setting? I think that there was also thinking about, um, you know, recommendations, especially with some of those other populations. And I imagine most of the advice that we just gave would still apply. Um, and, and I think there are some unique aspects um, to working with pediatric populations. So I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Schlesinger, but if either of um, either Dr. Rose or Dr. Smith wants to add in, please feel free after. Well, I think that pediatrics has a long history of anticipatory guidance as a component of what they do. And that is essentially behavioral health advice starting from the minute the child is born, right? Yeah. So, um, and that's really how we approach practices and say, you are already doing this. You are already giving advice about sleep and eating and these basic things from day one. Um, so a lot of pediatricians are ready. They want this. And, you know, just like family practice doctors, it's also though concerning when they say, we really need you. Like, no, 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 <laughs> we need to work together to bring us sort of all up. So, so I think that I, I, you know, pediatricians and family practice doctors have different experiences with kids from a clinical perspective. So this is another sort of do your homework with your practice, sort of figure out what they're comfortable with and don't just assume if that was a psychiatrist that asked that question, that they might be comfortable with SSRIs. They might not be. And family practice doctors won't be comfortable with stimulants. That's sort of a clinical perspective. Um, uh, from an, an, another perspective is obviously like parents are going to be a bigger part <laughs> of this than your than family in the rest of um, healthcare, even though family is important everywhere. Uh, so you need to be cognizant of that. Also recognize, you know, uh, someone in our health system says now that he thinks that um, parents can be like care managers sometimes, right? <laughs> so, um, so you may be able to really leverage that mm -hmm. to help make the services sort of even flow a little longer than you might than you might be able to with other populations. Um, you know, I think uh, there are less child psychiatrists per child out there uh, than general psychiatrists. Geriatrics has the same problem on the obvious end, end of the spectrum, um, that they're, they're never going to be enough of us, even close. Um, so, you know, I think that um, we have worked hard to work with all of our allied health professionals um, who are really starting to identify the nurse practitioners and PAs that are becoming the behavioral health specialist in the practice. Uh, we really encourage them to call, to consult with our psychiatrists on a regular basis um, because they may or may not come with as much um, sort of history as, as, as psychiatrists do in terms of training. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but. Yeah, I heard a couple of things that I'll just kind of highlight. I mean, I think one of the things is really, um, thinking about what, where there's common ground already. So there's a lot of things that, you know, um, are in common between sort of the goals of behavioral health and the goals of a pediatrician or family doc who's working with kids, right? So the idea that you can really, um, anticipatory guidance, that behavioral interventions early, you know, all of those things are things that I think there's shared goals around. And I think um, I also heard in there um, a lot around, um, 
thinking a lot about what people are going to be comfortable, like what's the next step in comfort that you can build in a practice. So, you know, really thinking about, you may not be able to go all the way from, you know, being comfortable with some anticipatory guidance to using an antipsychotic, right? So you're probably going to have to like work in increments there. And, and we're happy about that, right? Yeah, so, exactly. You know, I think another thing that I forgot to mention that I think is really key, if you don't have a relationship with your local pediatrics group or pediatrician yet, call them and offer to do 20 minutes on an SSRI, 20 minutes on depression, 20 minutes on anxiety um, over lunch. Just a little bit of education goes a long, long way to starting to build that, that um, relationship. And you know, I remember when I first started with the pediatricians in our area, I'd do a little talk and then I'd leave time at the end for them to ask about their last patient. <laughs> um, and I learned more about what that practice was doing and who was gonna be my partner and who were the cowboys <laughs> um, that I might need to sort of rein in a little bit in those 20 minutes that I just sort of left open to communicate and learn um, than I did uh, sort of in the teaching. So getting your foot in the door with some expertise, but then really um, spending some time answering some questions can go a long way informally. And I guess in these days of COVID, you know, we've been concerned that new programs might lose that because you're sort of scheduling things and not leaving unstructured time. So I would really encourage you to leave some unstructured time if you're just getting your foot in the door with a group uh, to start to make your friends and figure out who's going to be your champions. Yeah, I was hearing that really starting with a relationship and building that in from that you guys can, you know, build a, a you know, a shared vision for, for the future together. So I think that's really helpful advice. Um, I'm going to pivot. There was another question here uh, around um, sort of the other, uh, you know, another population that we sometimes uh, struggle with, which are people who have chronic illnesses. Um, so people with, you know, diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, um, and that, that they often have a high level of risk factor for depression. And sort of, I I'm curious if, you know, either Dr. Rose or Dr. Smith wants to kind of, I think Dr. Smith, you unmuted, maybe you want to say something about that and how behavioral health integrations might be integrated into the care of those patient populations. This is a very important topic, um, particularly as many of us are entering into the world of advanced payment models um, with the accountable care organizations. And we find that the chronic care management um, only requires those two chronic diagnoses, but what is our outcome? What is the, the uh, success with the outcome? And those patients where we have identified utilizing the uh, data that's coming in um, from our ACO by doing the PHQ-9 or the PHQ-2, doing the GAD-7, doing the audit, and getting that information gives us the answer as to why we were not seeing the success that we were looking for with the diabetes mellitus, um, with the hypertension. And so we actually pulled those patients together. And from that, we were then able to add those additional resources to take care of the mental health issues. And from there, we would then see a better outcome with the chronic diseases. I can't say enough in terms of the importance of integrating the two. If we're going to check a blood pressure then do a PHQ-9. That information is important. And then when we get the information, do something with it. Don't just mark it down and know it exists or mark it as a, another a HEDIS measure or HCC measure, a hierarchical care uh, measure. Do something about that individual's condition. Um, I'm certainly, I'm, I'm sure the others can chime in, but I, I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah. No, I really appreciate that. I mean, I think one of the things you're saying sort of addresses the question that came in too, which is that sometimes we can see elevated PHQ-9 scores in patients that have chronic illnesses. And I think what I hear you saying, and, and this has been my experience, is that that may be a real depression that needs to be addressed or, you know, something else. And so not to ignore those data, right? Like that that's a really important part of whole person care. So I think that's a really helpful um, focus. Um, and I see people kind of exclamation pointing all of those great points that you're making. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll turn to Dr. Rhodes for the, the last question and, and you know, then I'll give a minute for our other panelists to chime in. Um, 
you know, I'm curious about, I think people are interested to hear how sort of patients and families have responded to these models. I mean, you talked especially about the provider experience, but yeah. I, you know, you have kind of two models going on. I'm curious, how, you know, how that has been in your system. Um, I would say that, you know, overwhelmingly patients have been happy, you know, overall with the system, the navigation is much easier. They've, you know, really enjoyed the time uh, that they've spent with the LCSW. Um, I will say though, that not everything, right, is, is roses, you know, um, there are some patients who at the end of, we do a brief intervention and it's usually eight sessions. Sometimes there is some wiggle room one way or another, but when patients do need to be transitioned to someone else, that is a dissatisfier. Um, they've just built a relationship with someone and why can't they continue to see this person? Another dissatisfier, um, could be costs. Um, sometimes, especially our patients with high deductible plans, the way that our cost structure is kind of put forward and the codes that we're using in order to pay for our call center and other resources, it can be felt differentially by different patients and we don't always know, right, going up front. And so we have disclaimers that we have to read, but that doesn't feel the same as a bill. And so um, it's, I think those are the two major downsides, but Generally, overall, I think our patients have been so thankful to get plugged in. This was so much easier than it was last time. Why didn't we have this before? Um, you know, so-and-so has been so helpful for my care. Yeah. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Schlesinger? Sorry, I was looking at the, the message I got here. I, I guess what I wanted to say is that patients love this. Yeah. <laughs> Families love this. Parents are really fearful to take their kids to behavioral health. Um, even in days of the pandemic, when um, we're talking about how everybody has additional sort of behavioral health load, um, there's still stigma. So, you know, these programs, even though I think you're right, once they like their therapist, they don't want to move. <laughs> um, but uh, it really can help sort of for families that have never been exposed to the behavioral health system that may need to go that direction for to give them sort of a nice transition in a place that they're comfortable. So you know, yeah, even if it's exactly. hard, it might be still supportive to make that transition into, into the level of care that they're actually going to need for the long term. So I will second that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Smith, did you want to add anything else? I did. And because we are providing the services within this patient centered medical home, everything we do in the practice and most of us do is centers around the patient. So we've actually been able to minimize that stigmatism. Other people don't know why they're coming in and they're meeting with the counselors um, in the days when we had face-to-face -face and everything's telehealth now. And so we were able to minimize that. One of the concerns that I do have, likewise, is the cost. Um, I, I'm in a state where we do not have the uh, healthcare insurance, uh, Medicaid expansion and other types of services that pay for those services. We don't have that. And I, I worry about that. The other thing I worry about is when we have uh, these other entities coming in who want to provide the mental health services for our patients, yet we really don't know them. Um, they're kind of vendors who are doing this on the side. Well, it takes away from that continuity of care. And that I, I do worry about. I recognize as a source of a service, as a nice service, but making sure if we're going to utilize it, that we have also implemented the trust factor. This let our patients know that this service is one that we trust. And just as you trusted me, I want to make sure that you're getting what you need. And if we do that, I think we'll, we will have greater benefit for our patients in terms of the access and the quality and the efficiency of the services that we're trying to provide. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that because I do think it means a lot to patients when you can say, you know, this is a provider that I know would be a good fit for you, even if it's hard to make that transition. This is a service that I think could be really helpful for you that, um, that tr you can leverage that trust, that relationship and really make a big difference in people feeling the support they need to make it over that barrier sometimes of, of connecting to the support they need. So that those are, I think those are all really important things. I think hearing about some of the things that you need to consider is really helpful. I mean, I think anticipating some of these challenges um, will help you as you start your journey. I, I feel really inspired by the stories we've heard today. I, I really am grateful um, for this panel um, and all the wisdom you guys have shared today. So thank you guys so much. Um, and I know that it, we're at time, so I'm going to end. Um, 
Um, and I think our AMA colleagues, you know, the series continues. So if you found this helpful, um, the next set of these series are really going to dive into each specific topic. Some of the things that we kind of touched on at a highlight, financing, um, building workflows, those kinds of really practical details that I think are really helpful and can sometimes be obstacles obstacles, but um, as you heard today, can be overcome. So um, thank you all for um, your participation and for those of you who listened and asked questions. Um, I think it's um, really exciting um, to see all of the people invested in, in this work and, and increasing access to effective mental health treatment. So thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Thank you.